Now let me give you one more scenario on setting goals. When I started making my first list, Mr. Shelf said, Mr. Rohn, looks like we're going to be together for a while. He said, I've got a suggestion for you. He said, I think one of the first goals you ought to set, you're 25-year-old American male, sure you've made some mistakes, but now you're on the road to better things. You got a family worth it. Reasons makes the difference. And he said, you've got every reason to do this. He said, why don't you, among all the goals you're going to set, said, why don't you set a goal to become a millionaire? A millionaire. This is America. All the possibilities are available. Why don't you set a goal eh? to become a millionaire? He said, it's got a nice ring to it. <laughs> millionaire. Enough zeros to impress your accountant. Millionaire. And he said, here's why. Now I thought, the man doesn't need to teach me why. I'm thinking, wouldn't it be great to have a million dollars? He said, no, that's not it. Here's why. And I had one of the greatest lessons I ever learned, and I'm about to share it with you. This will be worth the price of being here today if you can capture what I'm about to share with you. Babysitter fees, whatever else you pay. Some of you missed some sales today to be here, so this is a costly day for you. But what I'm about to share with you changed my whole life. Here's what Mr. Shove said. Set a goal to become a millionaire. And he said, here's why. For what it will make of you to achieve it. And I got one of the greatest classes in one sentence I've ever received in my life. Set a goal that'll make you stretch that far for what it will make of you to achieve it. What a brand new reason for setting goals. What an all-encompassing challenge to have a better vision of the future. What for? To see what it will make of you to achieve it. And here's why. The greatest value in life is not what you get. The greatest value in life is what you become. Major question to ask on the job is not, what am I getting here? That's not the major question. The major question to ask is, what am I becoming here? It's not what you get that makes you valuable, it's what you become that makes you valuable. So Shelf said, set a goal to become a millionaire for what it will make of you to achieve it. Then he said, when you finally have become a millionaire, now, he said, what's important is not the money. I thought, wow, I've got some more to learn. <laughs> he said, no, no, Mr. Ron, I'm telling you honestly, you could just give the money away. Now, I did better than that, right? I told you. I lost it all. <laughs> I'm rich by the time I'm 31. I'm a millionaire. I'm broke by the time I'm 33. So I didn't have to give it all away. I lost it all. Foolish mistakes I made. That I'm a farm boy from Idaho. That early money drove me bonkers. I used to say, how many colors does it come in? I'll buy them all. I just went, I went crazy over that first money. I just went crazy. And then I made that one foolish mistake, right? Continuing guarantee. I mean, you know, I'm so naive off the farm. I don't know what continuing means. And a few other mistakes. And by the time I'm 33, I'm broke. Now I've made and lost millions since then. But what an experience that was. And I'm telling you, the man was right. When I finally was broke at age 33, guess what I discovered? My money did not mean that much. It represented only a fraction of all my assets. Show said, once you become a millionaire, Mr. Rohn, you can give all the money away. Because he says, what's important is not the money. What's important is the person you've become. Now, give me, let me give you the key phrase on setting goals. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Set the kind of goals that will make something of you to achieve them. Always keep that in mind. What will this make of me? If I set this goal and go for it, not only will I achieve it, but what will it make of me in the process? What a whole new concept on setting goals. 
Now there's two parts to this, and then we're wrapping up goals. Here's the first part now in this goal setting for what you become. Number one, don't set your goals too low. Interesting, we teach in leadership. You'll find it on the cassettes. Don't join an easy crowd. You won't grow. Go where the expectations are high. Go where the demands are high. Go where the pressure's on to perform, to grow, to change, to develop, to read, to study, to develop skills. I belong to a small group. We do business around the world. You cannot believe the expectations at that level. What we expect of each other in terms of excellence. Far beyond average. Why? So that we can each grow. So that we can receive from the group. We can contribute to the group. Something unprecedented. It's called living at the summit. Go where the demands are high. Go where the expectations are strong. So that it'll provoke you, push you. Urgently. Insist that you not remain the same for the next couple of years, the next five years, that you'll grow and change. So don't set your goals too low. The guy says, well, I don't need much. Well, then you don't need to become much. <laughs> now here's the last part on setting goals. Don't compromise, don't sell out. There were some things I went for back in those early years that I paid too big a price for. If I'd have known how much it was going to cost me, I never would have paid, but I didn't know. So don't sell out. Ancient phrase says, count the cost, count the cost, count the cost. An ancient story says, Judas got the money. You say, well, that's a success story. No, no. <laughs> it's true, 30 pieces of silver in those days was a sizable fortune. You say, well, if a guy's got a fortune, right, that's a success story. No, you don't understand. His name was Judas. Doesn't that ring a bell? Judas. You say, oh, yes, Judas, Judas, the traitor. That's right, the traitor got the money. Doesn't that change the story? And the answer is, of course, it changes the story. Interestingly enough, after Judas gets the money from becoming a traitor, he's got the money in his hot little hand, and now he's unhappy. Somebody says, well, if you had a fortune, how could you be unhappy? Well, he wasn't unhappy with the money. He was unhappy with himself. Key phrase, the greatest source of unhappiness is self-unhappiness. The greatest source of unhappiness doesn't come from outside. The greatest source of unhappiness comes from inside. And here's where the erosion starts, doing a little less than you could. That's where the beginning little infection of unhappiness starts, doing a little less than you can, not feeling that good about yourself. So don't let that happen. Judas is unhappy. He says, what will I do? He says, oh, I'll just take the money back. Walked in where he got the money and said, here, take this money. I'm unhappy. They said, heck with you, Judas. We got what we wanted. You got what you wanted out. They threw him out with his money. Judas says, well, what will I do now? He says, oh, clever. Should have thought of this first. I'll just throw the money away. And he proceeded to throw his fortune away. Why would he throw his fortune away? He was so unhappy with himself. And that's not even the end of the scenario. After he threw his fortune away, he couldn't change what he became, a traitor. And now in total abject frustration, he goes out and hangs his worthless self. Which all traitors should do, save the state the money. Why such a tragic end? Because he was so unhappy with himself. He sold out. He sold out. He paid too big a price. Ancient script sums it all up. He said, what if you gain the whole world and it cost you your soul too big a price to pay? If you got the whole world, don't sell out. Don't compromise your values.
Don't compromise your virtues. Don't compromise your philosophy. Key. Here's the key word, beware. If Judas could speak back, he'd probably say, beware. Two good words from ancient script. One, behold, the positive word. Behold the possibilities, behold the opportunity. Behold the drama, behold the awesomeness, behold the uniqueness. Behold the majesty, behold, behold. What a good word. But here's the other word. Beware, beware, beware. Don't sell out. Mark well what you become in pursuit of what you want. But I'm inspiring you, hopefully, to set the kind of goals that will transform your life. Make you far better than you are, far stronger than you are. Okay. Isn't this good advice? This is such good stuff. I should have paid to get in, right? <laughs> Bad boys. What should a child do with a dollar? Let me give you the best advice I've got. And this is called sort of middle of the road scenario. And I'll show you how these numbers may change. But here's what I teach. Kids never spend more than 70 cents. Okay, now you gotta pick some number. When I met Mr. Shelf, I was at about 110%. <laughs> but remember this, if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. Good little scenario. So here's the number that I found works best in, in developing a good financial plan. Never spend more than 70 cents out of every dollar from now on. Now kids ask me what? What do you do with the other 30 cents? Here's my best advice. 10 cents, charity. 10% charity. Supporting worthy projects, helping people who cannot help themselves. Some churches teach tithe, peace, portion. Turning back part of what you take out. Excellent, excellent philosophy. That's what that 10% is. And nothing teaches children responsibility and character better than generosity. No school, no class, no teacher can teach character better than the simple act of generosity. Ten cents out of every dollar. Now you can pick your own number. I'm just giving you my best scenario. Now the time to start this is when the amounts are small. Easy to give a dime out of a dollar. I'm telling you, kids will give you 10 cents out of every dollar if it's part of their philosophy, if you sell them on it. And that's the time to start when it's easy, 10 cents out of a dollar. A little harder to give 100,000 out of a million. <laughs> Someone says, oh, if I had a million dollars, I'd give 100,000. I'm not that sure. <laughs> We better start you early when the amounts are small so it'll all be set in when the big amounts start to come, okay? So 10 cents for charity. The next 10 cents I call active capital. Capital meaning, meaning try to make a profit yourself. We live in a capitalistic society. Right? Everybody now wants to join capitalism. That's why the walls are coming down. Capital belongs in the hands of the people. That's where the genius is. So the genius is to try to show a profit. Buy and sell. Render service. Show a profit. Now here's what I teach kids. Profits are better than wages. Wages are okay. But wages help you make a living. Profits help you make a fortune. The key is to just understand philosophically a little simple economic scenario. And there's all kinds of ways to make a profit. 
I'm working on a new book. Here's what it's called. I think it's going to be called. Of course, kids should pay taxes. It's going to be an interesting book. In California, where I live, kids do pay taxes. If an eight-year-old walks into 7-Eleven, buys something that costs a dollar, the proprietor makes him cough up seven more pennies. Eight-year-old says, what's these seven pennies? Proprietor says, that taxes. That's taxes. Kid says, well, I'm only eight. Proprietor says, congratulations, you're my youngest taxpayer. <laughs> so in California, kids do pay taxes. Now the question is, should they? Now the title of my book is, of course, kids should pay taxes. You got it. Right? The disciple went and caught a fish, found the miracle coins, and paid his taxes and Jesus' taxes. So way back then, Jesus did pay taxes. Now the question is, should he? And the answer, my little book says, of course, Jesus and kids should pay taxes. Of course. Of course. If an eight-year-old wants to ride his bicycle on the sidewalk instead of in the mud, you have to pay taxes. Things cost money. You've got to pay taxes. <coughs> Aircraft carriers keep tyranny over there instead of over here. Aircraft carriers cost money. It's expensive to run this whole show. We can't use used missiles. I mean, you know, it's expensive to run the whole deal. <laughs> Of course, everybody has to pay. Now, active capital means try your best to show a profit. Now, there's many ways to show a profit, not just money. Touch something, leave it better than you found it. That's a profit. Some profits are intangible, some profits are tangible. Long before Earth Day, for all sophisticated people, it was very proper when you left your hotel room to turn out the lights. All educated people. Why? Leave a profit. It's so easy to flip the switch and leave a profit. So as well, the hotel gets the profit. What do you care? All you need to become is a person who leaves a profit. I talked to a man who runs a whole string of apartments. He said, guess what? Most people, when they rent an apartment, leave it, what? Trashed, worse than they found it. What kind of a reputation would that be? Whatever you touch turns to trash. Whatever you touch gets dirty. Nothing you touch gets better. See, that's a poor philosophy. No wonder it leads to poverty small lives as one writer said living lives of quiet desperation this is where it all begins failure to leave a profit when you can turn out the lights doesn't matter what it is become profit minded profits are better than wages because profit has the potential to make a fortune wages has the potential to make a living so I teach kids take part of your wages if you earn the money take part of it for charity and part of it to see if you can't make a profit and there's all kinds of ways my book's gonna be full of all kinds of ways kids can make money I teach kids how to have two bicycles one to ride and one to rent I mean, you know it doesn't take long to get into business you don't have to be a genius halfway bright you can start showing a profit now here's the next 10 cents called passive capital meaning let somebody else use the capital you provide it you're passive they're active and let them pay you interest profits and interest unique way to make a fortune in fact there's a bible philosophy i teach teenagers this bible philosophy here's what it teaches the borrower is servant to the lender Wow, so where is the power position? Not a spender, a lender. And if I've taught teenagers well, if you ask them among some of the things you want to be, you know, when you grow up, you know, as years pile on, 
What would you like to be? I'm telling you, among some of the things that they would like to be, if they've sat in on my classes or gotten some of my material, they were say, I want to be one of them lenders. Powerful position. Let somebody else use your capital. Some projects require more capital than any one person has. So we've got capital pools, whether you put it in a financial institution or whatever, right? Earn an interest, earn a profit, right? Buy a car and sell it for more than you paid for it. Why? Because you leave it better than you found it. Touch something and leave a profit. Okay, it's not just wrapped up in money and economics. This helps to teach all other scenarios of life on profit and capital and expenditures, what to do with your time and what to do with your life and as well as what to do with your money. Okay, now this little scenario I call the ideal. Now here's what's important, to set up the ideal and work toward it. Because at first you may not be able to do these numbers. Some people are in such a desperate situation currently, they got to go 97, 1, 1, and 1. I mean, you know, the I had to start there. Start with pennies. And remember, it's not the amount that counts. Mr. Shelf gave me the clear situation. Here it is. It's not the amount that counts. It's the plan that counts. When I met Mr. Shelf, I'm 25 years old. I said to him, if I had more money, I'd have a better plan. He said, no, Mr. Rohn, if you had a better plan, you'd have more money. Six years? Six years? In America, six years? Come on, it's not the money, it's not the amount, it's the plan that counts. So set up an ideal plan like this. Now you can rearrange this and modify it to suit yourself. I'm just giving you here as an example. So set up the ideal and then start making progress toward it. Okay. Because finally these numbers are going to change if you move on up into the higher area. Right? The people I work with around the world couldn't spend 70 cents out of every dollar would be obscene. That'd be too much. So these numbers are bound to change. I don't know what mine are. Probably 20% up here. A lot larger numbers down here. Okay. So these numbers can change. I'm just offering you a good sample philosophy. Remember, philosophy is the set of the sale. The economy is not the set of the sale for you. For you, the set of the sale is your own philosophy, your own thinking, your own plan, your own concept. Don't borrow somebody else's plan. Don't borrow somebody else's concept. Don't borrow the concept, you know, spend all you can, cross your fingers and hope for the best. Don't borrow that. Develop your own philosophy and I'm telling you, it'll lead you to unique places. Now, the rest of a lot of this is on the cassette tape. So let me just give you two or three more pieces of the scenario here. Then I want to talk about communications and then we're going to wrap it up. Okay. Here's two or three more parts of financial independence. Number one, keep strict accounts. This is the best of disciplines. Keep strict accounts. Did you ever hear this expression? I don't know where it all goes. Did you ever hear that? I don't know where it all goes. Oh, we'd love to have you run our company. You don't know where it all goes. Whoa. Did you ever hear this? It just gets away from me. It just seems it just gets away from me. Uh, we'd love to turn the world over you. It just gets away from you. Come on. You've got to have better disciplines than that. Let that be the 90%. Let that be the scenario of the 97%. But don't let it be your scenario. Don't let it become your philosophy. Keep strict accounts. Next, a new attitude. I had to develop a new attitude as well as new concepts. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my taxes. Shelf said, well, that's one way to live. I thought, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their taxes? He said, no. No, a few of us have gotten way past that. 
He says, once you understand what taxes are, here's what taxes are in our governmental system in our society. Taxes is how you care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. Democracy and liberty and freedom, free enterprise. Wouldn't you want to feed the goose that lays the golden eggs? Somebody says, well, the goose eats too much. That's probably true. I understand that. Of course that's true. But see, better a fat goose than no goose. And here's the truth be known. We all eat too much. Let not one appetite accuse another. Of course the government needs to go on a diet. So do most of us. But hey, you still have to care and feed the goose that lays the golden eggs once you understand that that's what it's for. See, it is so important, the right attitude. Here's what I used to say. I hate to pay my bills. You open up the mails, nothing but these window envelopes. Bills, I hate to pay my bills. Shelf said, well, that's one way to live. I said, well, doesn't everybody hate to pay their bills? He said, no, some of us are way beyond that. I said, is it possible to love to pay your bills? He said, yes. Reduce your liabilities? Increase your assets? Wouldn't you love to do that? So start a whole new attitude here. Next time you pay $100 on an account, put a little note in there and say, with great delight, I send you this $100. <laughs> I mean, they don't get many letters like that. Reduce my liabilities, increase my assets. My picture's changing, my picture's improving. I love to pay my bills. Keep the money in circulation. Pay my taxes, feed the goose that lays the golden eggs. It's a matter of attitude. And here's the last on attitude. Everybody must pay. Of course, life is called opportunity, but life is called price. But we must all pay, we must all share. One of the classic stories of all time from ancient Bible script says, Jesus one day and his disciples were standing by the church treasury, synagogue treasury, watching people as they came by and put their offering in the treasury. That wouldn't be a bad idea. Jesus and his disciples standing by the treasury while everybody walks by. Jesus says, how much was that? How much was that? Interesting. And the story said some people came by, put in big amounts. Some people came by, put in modest amounts, average amounts. And the story says then a little lady comes by and puts in two pennies in the treasury. Jesus says to his disciples, look at that. Look at that. His disciples said, two pennies, two pennies, what's two pennies? Jesus said, no, you don't understand. She gave more than everybody else. They said, two pennies is more than everybody else? He said, yes. Because I'm certain that her two pennies represented most of what she had. And if you give most of what you have, then you've given the most. Wow. What a lesson to learn. It's not the amount. It's what it represents of your life that counts. Now let me give you the wisdom of the scenario that did not occur. And this is the greatest of wisdom. And in my own particular peculiar brilliance, I have the ability to record for you what was not recorded in the scenario of the story. <laughs> Here's what did not occur, which may teach us one of the greatest of the wise things that was taught in this scenario. Here's, the, here's what did not occur in the scenario. Jesus did not reach into the treasury and get this little lady's two pennies and run after her and say, here little lady, my disciples and I have decided that you're so pitiful and you're so poor that we've decided to give you back your two pennies. I'm telling you that did not occur. If it would have occurred, she would have been, it would have been what? insulted. She would have rightfully said, I know my two pennies aren't much, but it represented most of what I had. 
And would you insult me by not letting me contribute what I wanted to contribute, even if it's only two pennies? I'm telling you that did not occur. Here's part of the wisdom of the story that was not recorded. Jesus left her pennies in the treasury, meaning everybody has to pay, even if it's only pennies. That's the key. And whether you start with pennies or whether you start with dollars or whether you start with nothing, remember, part of the scenario is to spend, of course. Part of the scenario is to invest and part of the scenario is to show a profit and part of the scenario is to help take care of people who can't take care of themselves. If you'll set up your own philosophy, I'm not asking you to buy my philosophy. I'm not asking you to adopt my numbers. I'm only wanting to provoke you to think for you to come up with a splendid economic philosophy that's got you up early and got you up late has got you thinking and pondering ways to use your resources and turn it into the dreams you want for the future. And that's my little story on financial independence. Okay. Here's the next and the last subject. Communication. How to affect other people with words. I've got a, just a four, a little four point program here for you to consider the whole expanded version now, three days, right? Three days of all this is in the, is in that package that you're taking home. So this is called an abbreviated version of all the rest, this one day, video day. Four steps to good communication. Here's number one, first of all, words can work miracles. That's why communication is so important. Words can work miracles. Words are powerful. Words are almost godlike. In fact, ancient script says the word was God. God was the word. Wow, words and God. I said to my Israeli audience last year, in the beginning, the story of creation is unique. It says in the beginning, Jehovah God spoke and said what? We've got some students here, I'm sure. In the beginning, Jehovah God spoke and said what? Let there be light. And what? There was light. Wow! <laughs> wow! It looks like words create light. Is that possible? I'm telling you it's possible. Humans can get pretty close. What if somebody can't possibly see how they could do well, how they could become successful? how they can transform their lives and their health, their future and their finances spiritually in every other way. They can't see and you come along and share your story and maybe borrow some other stories. And by the time you get through with a good presentation to this person, they say, now I can see. Before you got here, I was blind. I was in the dark. And while you were talking some things, dawned on me. Is it possible to create light with human intelligence, with words? And the answer is, of course, of course. Here's part of the spectacular opportunity as a human being. One person talking to another. It's got so much power, so much potential. A mother talking to a daughter, a father talking to a son salesperson talking to a client. Nothing more magical and powerful, awe-inspiring than words have the ability to dramatically affect people's lives and futures. So become a good communicator. Let me give you some good keys to good communication. Here's number one, have something good to say. Communication starts with preparation. Getting ready to speak this year, getting ready to speak next year. Attend the classes, read the books. Have something good to say. Here's four good words to help you to have something good to say. One is interest, develop a new interest in people and life and what's going on, economics and politics, religion, social structure, possibilities, opportunities, develop a new interest. Here's the next word, fascination, goes that step beyond interest. That's why kids learn so much that first six years. Fascination. 
Adults are walking on ants. Kids are saying, don't walk on these ants. I'm studying these ants. I'm looking at these ants. Kids are so fascinated. How come an ant can carry something bigger than he is? Wow. That's how come they learn so much. They're fascinated. And here's another little clue I've learned. Turn frustration into fascination if you can. You'll learn more. I've worked on this. I'm pretty good at it. Out in Los Angeles, I'm on the freeway. My airplane leaves in 45 minutes. The traffic is moving, not one inch. I am now fascinated. <laughs> I'm telling you. Now, it doesn't work every time. That's true, but every time it does work, I'm telling you, you'll come away with more. Learn to be fascinated instead of frustrated if you possibly can. Turn that little scenario on for yourself. Next is sensitivity. You gotta understand, we use the phrase, where people are coming from, where they've been, what's going on. Sensitivity training is so important. People not like you, people that have got challenges and problems and difficulties. You gotta do your best to be sensitive to other people, where they find themselves, the pit they might be in currently, what's going on, be sensitive to that. Here's two of the greatest things said about Jesus. One, it said he was touched. He was touched by where he found some people. He was touched by the misery he found some people in. He was touched, he was touched. And here's the other word, he was moved, it said. He was moved, touched and moved. If you really want to communicate well, you got to be touched and moved. Not just by your own drama of life, but by the drama you know is going on in other people's lives. Sensitivity. How does an adult 40 talk to a child who's 12? You got to be sensitive. Not just to your current situation. One of the best ways to identify with a child who's 12 and you're 40 is remember when you were 12. Go back, go back. Remember the scenario and let it hit you again, let it touch you again. I don't have any problems with 12 year olds. I remember almost every day of being 12. 12 is a unique year. One, you're not 13. I mean, you know. <laughs> if I heard it once, I heard it a hundred times. Of course you can't go, you're not a teenager. Wow, I can't wait for this year to be finished. Remember, that's part of sensitivity. Remember, apostle. One who became an apostle, leader of the Christians, was once Saul from Tarsus, hater and killer of the Christians. After he was converted, became a leader, became Paul apostle, revered. Why was he so effective in his language and his ability to touch people with his words and with his presence? If you read part of the scenario of his history, he gave an account of his own life and said, here's why I think I'm so effective. I remember the pit I came from. Sure, they call me apostle, but I used to kill these Christians and I never forget that. If I want to get in touch with other people's difficulty, I got to remember my own difficulty. Let it hurt again. That's what makes a good performance, a good actor, a good actress. The emotion close to the surface from the remembrance of things past and then well-chosen words delivered with emotion, power. The last word is knowledge. You just gotta go through exercises like this. Take the notes, work hard, roll up your sleeves, go to work. Gather the knowledge in journals, gather the knowledge in notebooks, gather the knowledge in a library and cassettes and videos and every other means. Gather knowledge. Don't be lazy in learning. A major part of communication is preparation. Now here's the next part of good communication. Say it well. One is having something good to say. Number two is saying it well. Let me give you a quick list on saying it well. Number one, sincerity. 
best place to start, if you want to communicate well, is let your sincerity show. Next is repetition, the mother of skill. I've been at this 33 years. Somebody says, well, you give a pretty good seminar. I should, 33 years? 33 years? Repetition. Next, brevity. Sometimes you don't need many words if you're totally sincere, I'm telling you. Jesus' presentation and gathering up his team called disciples was fairly short. He just walked around the countryside, took a look at somebody and said, you follow me. That's brief. I mean, you know, that's short. <laughs> now, why could he get by with such few words? And this takes care of a lot that I've tried to share with you today called personal development. Here's why I think Jesus could get by with such few words for all that he was that he didn't have to say. Take that scenario home for all that I am that I don't have to say. Just a few words could be dynamic in affecting someone else's life. A child, a business colleague, a sales client. Next, vocabulary. Got to work on your vocabulary. Some of my friends took a survey among prisoners working on some rehabilitation program. They weren't particularly looking for this, but here's what they found. There's definitely a relationship between vocabulary and behavior. And here's what they found out. The more limited the vocabulary, the more tendency to poor behavior. And when you think about it for a while, it makes sense. Words are a way of seeing. And if you don't have a good vocabulary, you can't see very well. Can you imagine the mistakes in judgment when you can't see very well? Next, words are a way of expressing what's going on in your head, what's going on in your heart. What if you can't see well and you can't express well? You can imagine the tragic scenario of five years of that, 10 years of that, 20 years of that showing no improvement. Behavior now becomes a major problem. And that person's world gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Why? They can't see and they can't express. And finally, they don't need much bigger place than a 10 by 12 cell. Their world is so small anyway, don't need much bigger place. I'm asking you to stretch your vocabulary. I used to put words up on a 3x5 card. I drove a lot back in those days, but at the end of the day, I'd mastered two or three words. My oldest daughter, Linda, with my grandkids, starts the day with what's called the word for the day. And she writes it on a chalkboard, the word for the day. And the kids memorize that word and the meaning of the word. And every once in a while during the day, she'll say, what's the word for the day? The last day I was there, the word was superficial. Natalie's four, Nathaniel's five. And several times during that day, Linda, my daughter, would say, what's the word for the day? Natalie would say superficial. And she would say, Nathaniel, what does that mean? On the surface. Several times during the day, what's the word for the day? Superficial. What does it mean? On the surface. If you were to ask my grandkids, the last time grandpa was here, what was the word for the day? I'll bet you they'd probably know, superficial, on the surface. Word for the day. Why not learn a word a day? Why not add to your vocabulary so you can see more, see better, and express better? Put out in words what's in your heart, what's in your soul, what's in your mind. So say it well. Here's number three. Number one was have something good to say. Number two, say it well. Here's number three. Read your audience. These are just simple concepts now. You've got to add some of the details, but that's what I'm mainly good for is concepts. 
read your audience. If you're talking to a child, you've got to study the face of the child. You've got to study a little body language. You've got to study what's going on. So you'll know whether to shift gears, come on a little stronger, ease off a little, might be too strong, search for another illustration, soft, strong. A lot of that is dictated by reading your audience. When I first started lecturing, I had some challenges here. I was so absorbed in my notes, lecturing like this, I'm telling you, in those early days, the audience could have left and I kept right on going. I didn't know what was going on down here. I didn't know what was going on over here. I didn't have any idea what was happening over here, whether I should come on a little stronger, ease back. I didn't know. I couldn't read my audience. So read your audience, a prospect, read. Now let me give you some ways to read. Number one, by what you see. Body language tells us some things. How to shift gears, whether to go on, whether to stop. If you're talking to somebody and they're leaning toward the door, that means you gotta hurry, right? They're not gonna be here long. Body language. Guy's got his arms folded, chin tucked down. You got your work cut out for you. You're gonna have to reach deep in your bag. Find some extraordinary stories. This one's not gonna be easy. What tells you that? Reading what you see. Here's the next one. Read what you hear. You got to read a child's impatience. Kids don't mind telling you whether they're bored or impatient. Kids, attention span is short. Doesn't last long. You gotta get it said. You start talking to a child, 30 seconds they say, how long is this gonna take? <laughs> Whoa! Read. Listen. Listen for the response. Now you'll know whether to shift gears, change your language, find a new illustration, soften, stronger. Read your audience. Read what you see, read what you hear. And here's one of the most important, read what you feel. Now women are probably better at this than men when it comes to picking up emotional signals. Men, they can see and men, they can hear. But it takes a little training for a man to pick up those emotional signals that are so important so you don't say the wrong stuff. Because it's so easy to make a mistake in language. What if you meant to say to someone you care about? What if you meant to say, what's troubling you? And instead you said, what's wrong with you? Communication. So read the emotional signals. If we could learn from the women on this emotion. Women have this uncanny antenna picking up this stuff. Stuff. Woman says, doesn't feel right. I mean, what does that mean? It doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel right. <laughs> women have got the women have got it though. Seems to be built in. Especially danger. Women pick it up quicker than men. It's built in, I think. Way back, right? Man was the provider, mama was the protector at home. So she picked up this scenario of danger, I think, these signals. But they are good. In the middle of the night, mama wakes up. The baby cries, mama wakes up. Papa sleeps. <laughs> Faintest cry, mama's awake. Or she nudges her husband and says, go look, go look, something isn't right. He says, what do you mean it isn't right? She says, no, go look. He said, hey, everything's okay. She says, go look. He says, okay. And he gets out of bed, goes downstairs. The front door is open. How did she know that? We don't know. I mean, she just knows, she just knows. But I'm telling you, it's so valuable in communication to be able to pick up the emotional signals as well as what you see and as well as what you hear. It's so important. 
but women are good. Ancient scenario says this, there are shepherds and there are sheep and there are wolves. What a good life scenario. But it doesn't stop there. This ancient scenario says also, some wolves are so clever, they've learned to dress up like sheep. <laughs> now you gotta have a woman. <laughs> gotta have a woman. Man says, looks like a sheep, talks like a sheep. Woman says, ain't no sheep. <laughs> Take my word for it. Oh. They know. Read. Pick up the signals. Don't ignore the signals. Develop this personal development scenario, communication, financial independence, and all the rest. Now, here's the last part. Intensity. Words mixed with emotion. Words mixed with hate. Words mixed with love. Words mixed with faith. Words mixed with courage. That's what's powerful. <coughs> words have a certain effect, but words loaded with emotion have an incredible effect. If I had a little straight pin, a right, guy buys a shirt, it's got all these little pins in it. I take out all these pins. If I took one of those little straight pins and I threw it at you, and let's say it reached you and hit you in the face or hit you in the hand, you'd feel it. This little straight pin, you'd feel it. That means I got you with my words. But what if I took that little straight pin and wired it to the end of an iron bar about that long? See, I could drive that pin through your heart. The pin is the words, the iron bar is the emotion. Emotions. Here's the best I could share with you. Put more of you into what you say. Don't be casual in language. Don't be casual in, in words. Casualness leads to casualties on the freeway and in communication. Don't be lazy in learning good communication. And put more of you. Now here's the last thought. The emotions must be measured. It can't be too much for the occasion if it's not called for. In leadership we teach, don't shoot a cannon at a rabbit. It's effective, but you've got no more rabbit. So here's some of the most powerful scenario in communication. Here it is. Well-chosen words mixed with measured emotion. Basis of affecting people with good communication. Well-chosen words mixed with measured emotion. And one last point on communication. The more you care, the stronger you can be. The more you care as a mother, the stronger you can be with your children. You, the more you care as a father, the stronger you can be. The more you care as a leader, the stronger you can be in helping to solve problems, getting on somebody's case. The more you care. But you gotta care. I don't mind a minister consigning my soul to hell fire for my sinful ways. I don't mind that. If he believes it, I don't mind him consigning my soul to hellfire for my sinful ways, as long as he does it with tears and not with joy. <laughs> if you're going to preach a message on hellfire and consign people to hell's fire, you got to cry and sob your way through a sermon on hellfire. We would all dismiss as a performance a dry-eyed sermon on hellfire. You can't legitimately preach hellfire unless your heart breaks. Otherwise, it's a performance. Otherwise, we could all dismiss it. Why? The heart's not there. There are some conversations that don't make sense unless they're accompanied by tears. It doesn't mean anything unless it's accompanied by a broken heart. Learn measured emotions. Remember, draw from, 
well-chosen words, expanded vocabulary, be interested and fascinated. Pull all this together. I'm telling you, your ability to touch other people will grow day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Here's my last subject. It comes in two parts. First is the negative part. And I got just a couple of tips for you on negative. There wouldn't be positive without negative. It's part of the life scenario. Ancient script says it best. There's a time to laugh. And once you've learned to laugh, just keep on laughing. No, no, no. Just get another positive book. No, no. There's a time to laugh, what? And a time to cry. And you've got to become so sophisticated and so well-educated that you don't laugh when it's time to cry. And you've also got to learn to cry well. How are you going to identify with some people if you don't cry with them? It's very important. The negative side is very important. Negative thinking. I teach kids, and you'll find it on those cassettes, the ant philosophy. Let me just give you the quick scenario on the ant philosophy. Number one, ants never quit. What a good philosophy. If they're going somewhere, you stop them, and guess what? They'll look for another way. How long will they look? Till they find it, or till they die. What a great philosophy. But here's number two. I can't give them all to you, but here's number two. Ants think winter all summer. You've at least got to be that bright. You can't think summer all summer. You've got to do some winter thinking in the summer. You say, well, the sky is blue. The clouds are fleecy. You can't be faked out by that. Ancient story says, don't build your house on the sand in the summer. Why would we be cautioned not to build our house on the sand in the summer? Because it's easy to get faked out. So what should you do during the summer? Think winter. Think storm. That'll drive you to find a rock in the summer when the sky is blue. Key, negative is normal. You gotta handle it. You can't dismiss it. It's part of the life scenario, like your white corpuscles we talked about earlier. So don't ignore it. Let it be part of the scenario. Here's the key. Learn to master it. Negative is not to be ignored. It's to be mastered. It makes us better than we are to wrestle with it. It makes us better than we are to be alerted to tyranny that moves into Kuwait or ignorance that moves into your life or procrastination that moves in and robs you of your fortune. Or poor health that's going to be the legacy of those who neglect their health disciplines. You got to do battle with the enemies on the outside and on the inside. So learn how to handle the negative. And now here's the last last called the positive. Let me give you the day that turns your life around as quickly as I can. I got four parts to the day that turns your life around and then we're finished for the day. Number one, disgust. Disgust. Disgust is a negative emotion but it can have a very positive, powerful effect. Disgust says, I've had it. What an important day that could be. I've had it. I met a beautiful, powerful, accomplished executive lady in New York. The company invited me to come in. This lady was a vice president, an extraordinary lady. I got to know her and I, I found out her story. I said, how did you get here? Big income. And she never went to high school, never went to college, never went to university. I said, how did you get here? Executive, powerful income she said well let me tell you part of the scenario she said when i was a young mother a few years ago she said one day i asked my husband for ten dollars and he said what for <coughs> She 
She said, before that day was over, I decided I would never, ever ask again. She said, I started studying opportunity, found it, took the classes, put myself through the schools, did the scenario. Now I'm vice president, I make a lot of money. And she said, I kept my promise. I've never, ever had to ask again. It's called a life-changing day. The day you say enough is enough. Now, if you can add an act to your disgust, it helps. The man takes a shotgun to his car, blows out every window, destroys every tire, puts a hundred rounds in it and says, I've driven this embarrassing thing for the last time. <laughs> and then he saves it. He saves it. And later when somebody says, how did you become rich and powerful? He says, let me show you this car. <laughs> One day I'd had it up to here, I blew it to smithereens. <laughs> enough is enough. Powerful. Here's the last three. Next is decision. Decision making is a life changing day. If you went home today and in the next few days cleaned up a list of decisions, it could furnish enough inspiration for the next five years, ten years. What an inspiring day, the day you can bring yourself to decide. And here's the third one, desire, wanting too bad enough. Who knows the mystery of that? We don't know. But here's something I do know. Sometimes desire waits for a trigger, waits for something to happen. Who knows what the happening may be? A song, the lyrics, a movie, the dialogue, a seminar, a sermon. A book, an experience, confrontation with an enemy, a conversation with a friend who finally levels with you. Whatever the experience it is, it's so valuable. And here's my best advice. Welcome all experiences. You never know which one is going to turn everything on. Don't put up the walls. The same wall that keeps out disappointment keeps out happiness. Take down the walls, go for the experience, let it teach you. And here's the last one, resolve. Resolve says I will, two of the most powerful words in the language. Benjamin Disraeli said nothing can resist a human will that will stake its existence on its purpose. Shortly put, I'll do it or die. Best definition of resolve I got from a little junior high girl, Foster City, California. I'm going through some words one day. I got to this one and I asked the kids, who can tell me what resolve means? Some didn't know, some tried. Interesting. The last one was the best. Little girl about three years back, she said, I think I know Mr. Owen. I said, what? She said, I think resolve means promising yourself you will never give up. I said, that's the best I've ever heard. She's probably giving seminars somewhere today, right? I mean, that's the best I've heard. I asked the kids, how long should a baby try to learn how to walk? How long would you give your average baby? Before you say, hey, enough, enough, no. Any mother in the world would say, you're crazy. My baby is going to keep trying what? Until, what a magic word. I want you to write it down. Until, promise yourself you'll read the books until your skills change. You'll go to seminars until you get a handle on it. You'll listen to it until it makes sense. You'll go for it until you understand it. You'll practice it until you develop the skill. Never give up until however long that is, step by step, piece by piece, book by book, word by word, apple by apple, walk around the block, walk around the block, go for it, don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become, then you'll discover 
some of life's best treasures when you pay that price. Now here's my last word to you. As leaders in the community, I'm sure you are. Parents, the greatest challenge of leadership is parenting. Whether you're in sales or management, wherever I found you today, I want to give you, from my heart to you, what I wished you would do from this seminar today. And if I've inspired you to do this part here, among all the other things I've talked about, I would have considered it worthwhile to leave my family, fly away from my home, drop down into Fort Worth, Dallas, and spend one of my very precious days with you. If I can accomplish this, it'll all be worthwhile. It comes in two parts, and here it is. One, learn to help people with their lives, not just their jobs. Learn to help people with their lives, not just their skills on the job. Touch people with a book, touch people with a poem, touch people with some words. Don't fail to say something that could be meaningful. Help people with their lives, help them set their goals. Help them with their dreams, help them with the future, help them with errors, help them with mistakes. Help people, help your kids. Not just get along, not just hang in there, not just try to hold the family together. Try to build lives with communication, build lives with setting goals. Help your kids with their lives, not just their homework, their lives. And here's my last one for you personally, because I'm probably the, one of the best examples of this standing before you in this auditorium today. Here it is. Ancient script says, if you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. If you work on your gifts, they will make room for you. Wow. Look where my gifts have brought me today to this room. A chance to invest in this many lives. Gifts, 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 gifts. In in a world filled with uncertainties, one thing remains constant: the power of prayers. Today we delve into a topic that resonates with the very core of our being: trust in your prayers. Life can be a journey of twists and turns, trials and tribulations. In those moments of uncertainty. When the road ahead seems unclear, it's easy to feel lost. But there's a beacon of hope that resides within each one of us. The power of prayers. Prayer is more than just what you tied into the universe. It's a connection, a profound conversation with the divine. But trust in the key that unlock true potential of your prayers. Trust in your prayers is not pure faith. It's a firm belief that your words, thoughts, and 
instantion have a resonance with the universe. It's about understanding that your prayers are not just requests. They are affirmations of your faith and resilience. <coughs> History is filled with stories of those who trusted in their prayers against all ODDS. Whether it's finding strength during moments of despair of speaking guidance in times of confusion. Those who trust in their prayers often find a source of unwavering support. When you trust in your prayers, you open yourself up to the possibilities of miracles. Your prayers become a powerful force, guiding you through challenges and paving the way up for success. It's about alleging your energy with the positive force in the universe. So how can we cultivate trust in your prayers? It starts with a deep belief in the power of your words. When you pray, do so with contribution. Con Feel the energy of your intentions and let the energy resonate with the universe. It's also about being patient and persistent. Trust is built over time and so is the impact of your prayers. Keep the faith even when the answer don't come immediately. The universe has its own timeline and in due course, your prayers will be answered. In the grand capacity of life, your prayers are the threads that can wave miracles. Trust in them. Trust in the process. Trust in the living plan that unfolds when you Alec your energy with the positive force around you. As you embark on your journey, remember, trust in your prayers and you will find the strength to overcome any obstacle. Your faith is a beacon of light that can illuminate even the darkest parts. So trust, believe and watch as your prayers mind manifest into a reality that accents your weirdest dreams. <laughs>